One day while killing monsters near the MDPL-05 power station, we notice a huge satellite dish off to the east. The dish appears to be pretty derelict. We see entire tiles missing from the dish. But I wonder if we can find any pre-war lore there. Now, as you know, I pay close attention to your comments. In my last video on the Capitol building, I read a lot of feedback saying that the noise of my Gauss rifle was a little distracting. And some said that maybe I should try to play the game without using such overpowered weapons. Well, fine, challenge accepted. I've changed my loadout for this video. For close range combat, we'll be using the double barrel shotgun from the Point Lookout DLC. For melee combat, we'll be using Stab Happy that we got in a raider shack east of the Bethesda ruins. For long range sniping, we'll be using the backwater rifle that we got by completing the Velvet Curtain during the Point Lookout DLC. And our heavy weapon of choice will be Eugene, our reward for helping Riley's Rangers. You can find links to the videos I made when I found all these weapons in the description below. Heading that way, we see that it's erected at the top of a nearby hill. We have to go down into a valley filled with water to get there. At the bottom of this valley, we see a dock stretching into the water, guarded by raiders. It's a little more tricky sniping with this backwater rifle. Heading down the hill, we can pull out our double barrel shotgun to give these raiders the hot end of our business. Everything sort of just tumbled down into this valley to fight each other at the same time. When the coast is finally clear, we can explore this dock. It's a bit of a typical raider dive. Lots of bottles and junk and scrap all over the place. A little bit of Meyer Lurk meat, some whiskey, and super mutants. Hey! Whoever want to waste ammo in the future, now I know where to go. Back on the dock, if we move to the eastern side of it, we find a bookshelf, and here we find a mini nuke. On top of the shelf, we find some psycho, and on the opposite end, we find a right away, two stim packs, a medex, and a blood pack. On the eastern side of the countertop is an average locked ammo case. Just south of here, we see some beds, a missile launcher, jet and whiskey on a table, and another ammo canister. There's some buff out on a trash can you can see right here, but I missed it because I got distracted by another Mirelurk. Well, that's the end of that. And finally, if we hop into the water to explore a boat, we find a stealth boy partially submerged. Please forgive the water glitches. I'm playing Fallout on my new computer, and the transition from my old hasn't exactly been smooth. Still trying to iron out a few things here. With the valley clear of its menagerie of threats, we can finally scale the eastern hill towards this satellite dish. Creeping closer, we see someone on a balcony up top, but our Rubco compass doesn't go red. Is he hostile or not? As we get close, we get attacked by a Yaogwai, and we discover SATCOM Array NW05A. Oh, hostile, not friendly, talent company. I think that's it, and we appear to have found the door. Nearby, we find a rusted blue door, and just outside it, a sign. Fallout Shelter. What was a pre-war military satcom array doing as a fallout shelter? 
Heading inside, Dogmeat immediately begins to growl, but opening the door at the opposite end of the hallway, we just see a ghoul, and she immediately runs away. But we are being fired upon by someone. Racing up the stairs, we see Dogmeat murder the fling ghoul, Dogmeat. And then continuing up even further, we find more talent company. Yeah, I think I like this shotgun. This may have to be a permanent new feature on the program. Turning around, we see a ladder continuing upstairs. But before we go up, let's head all the way back down to the ground floor and return to the entrance to get our bearings so we have a point of reference while exploring the SATCOM array. On this ground level, we see a bit of a workshop to the north, a toolbox, some scrap, and a desk with a terminal. Inside the terminal, we find six log entries. I'm betting they're numbered chronologically, so we'll read from the bottom to the top. In log entry number one, Nothing says equality like a fistful of caps. I think these talent company mercs are about the most cordial smoothies I've met, as long as their boss is getting paid. Luckily, money's no issue. I've hoarded plenty of it up since before these guys' parents were knee-high on a Brahmin. Of course, if I succeed in this, it won't matter how many caps any of these rat bastards have. So the ghoul dog meat murdered hired these talent company mercs to protect her. She pays their boss directly, presumably Little Horn and Associates. But that last line is pretty threatening. She is working on a project, and if she succeeds, what? She'll kill the talent company? Moving on to log number two. Thanks to a little creative wiring, I was able to tap us into a power source. They're less common up here, but if you know where to look, there are still plenty of live power lines buried all over the wasteland. For all their arrogance, they knew a thing or two about engineering before the bombs. I have to admit, it's remarkable that there's still power to be had after all these years. Yes, I've often had the same thought. Now that we've got all the power we'd want, I can bring our defensive turret online and try to get the dish motors operational. Yeah, that turret ended up being a pain in the butt. She succeeded there, but does this mean she got the dish operational? Can we use it to contact a satellite? In number three, finally got to begin on my work in earnest today. Dish motivators are offline, but I was able to input some basic coordinates and ping nearby SATCOM arrays to the southwest and east. There was some interference pinging the NN03D array, probably rad roaches or something making a nest inside the dishes. It may be worth sending one or two of the mercs over there to clean it out in case I can use these towers to amplify my own signal. There were dozens of military satellites in orbit, just from the old records I found in the ruins. There must have been hundreds before the war. If I can find just a few operational platforms... So, even all these years after the bombs, there are still dozens of military satellites in orbit. It must have been even easier for Captain Maxon to use a satellite to reach out to West Virginia during the events of Fallout 76. In the next one... First attempts at atmospheric pinging returned negative. Considering that the motivators are still non-functional, it's going to be difficult to catch much of anything that doesn't pass directly over us. Still, I can't rule out other mechanical failure. I haven't got much astronomical reference material with me, but maybe I can find an old chart and wait until a celestial body passes over to confirm signal. Of course, that may take years. I'll have to keep working on the motivators. Ooh, sounds like a tough job. In the next one, what a lucky break! I pinged an orbiting body successfully today. Registration ID is USDOD 21TXH. Call sign Highwater Trouser. I'll begin tracking it and cross reference the registration information with the data I've got. Highwater Trouser, that's an odd name. I wonder what kind of satellite it was. And in the final one, Turns out I don't have specific data on my satellite, but the registration format suggests that it's a stationary micronuclear weapons platform. What? Of all the satellites to get access to. Tracking data appears to confirm this. The thing hasn't moved in the week I've been tracking it. Without a targeting platform at my disposal, sending an activation code would only cause it to drop a payload directly on top of this area. Not exactly what I'm aiming for but I'll keep the codes handy just in case. So, was this scientist's goal to gain access to an orbiting nuclear weapons platform and use it to, what, 
destroy talent company specifically or humanity in general. She clearly didn't want to destroy herself, otherwise she would have activated Highwater Trouser, which could only fire upon this location. Perhaps her corpse can tell us more. On the table, we find a copy of Chinese Army Special Operations Training Manual, and then we could take the stairs to the second platform. Here, we find another terminal, but this is just a turret control system terminal. I always find these things after I've destroyed the turrets. Moving west, we find a workbench and a bottle cap mine on the bottom. After looting a red toolbox, we can head south and loot the body of the ghoul. She has no name. She's just called Wastelander. But on her corpse, we find the Highwater Trousers activation code. We also find the SATCOM Array NN03D coordinates and the SATCOM Array NW07C coordinates. She was wearing a scientist outfit. This is a pretty rare outfit, worn by only a few characters who we end up killing, and otherwise worn by primary story characters like Dr. Lee. It only has a DR of 3, but it grants plus 5 to science. Taking a look at the High Water Trousers activation code, it appears to just be gibberish. And looking at the SATCOM array coordinates, we find what appears to be latitude and longitude markers. But our Pip-Boy can't seem to interpret them. At least we haven't found a way to download this information yet. We don't find the locations marked on our map. From here, we can take a second staircase up to the third and final floor. After looting the Talon Company Merc, we can take the ladder outside. This puts us out on a catwalk where we sniped Talon Company earlier. This winds all the way around the satellite dish until it goes up a staircase and through a big blue door. On the other side of the door, we find ourselves in a small circular room. There are two military cots hanging on the wall. We find medics and psycho nearby. Looks like the Talon Company were having a good time. Add some whiskey on another one. Directly behind us, we find a first aid kit on a wall and the satellite control terminal. Here we can decrypt the coordinates for the other satellite arrays. Sure enough, decrypting the first one marks SATCOM Array NW07C on our map. Looks like this is just to the southwest. We'll have to check it out in a minute. And decrypting the second one marks SATCOM Array NN03D on our map. This one is due east. Back in the terminal, we have two remaining options. We can try to enter new positioning data, but we get error. Dish motivators offline. That's right, the ghoul scientist said that she couldn't get them working. And then we find an option to upload high water trousers activation. Receiving activation code, blah, 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 blah. Authentication successful, targeting data none. Commencing launch. What? No, no, backspace, escape, uh, undo. Oh no, did I just launch nukes at myself? Heading up the ladder, we find a Talon Company Merc with a flamer inside the dish. Racing up to the side of the dish, we can peer over. Okay. Oh! And just like Archimedes II will fire on Earth in just a few years, high water trousers drenches the Earth with nuclear fire. But thankfully, these detonations each appeared to be much smaller than the nukes that destroyed the Earth on Armageddon. The detonations appear to be slightly larger than a mini nuke each. Amazing to think that that payload has been circling the globe for 200 years. Now, to find the other two SATCOM arrays. Peering off to the east, we see NNO3D, and then walking around to the other side of the dish, there it is, we see NW07C. Well, we'll explore them both, but let's start by exploring NW07C. Leaving NW05A, we can head down the hill to the southwest. As we climb down the hill, we hear commotion to the south. Good enough. But we arrived too late. The Wastelanders took care of it. That thing would have killed us all without your help. Thanks. Listen, you may as well take this map. That's where we were headed, but that Deathclaw cured me of my itch for Wasteland adventure. But they still assumed that we had something to do with it. 
They hand us a Wastelander map where we find the location of Rock Creek Caverns with the notation Mirelurk King's Treasure Chamber. This is part of a random encounter, but now that we know the location, we'll have to track down this Mirelurk King's treasure in a later video. But to continue, at the bottom of the valley we can cross the water, kill a Mirelurk King, and continue southwest, cresting a hill, crossing a ruined road and crumbling overpass, and then climb the hill to the southwest until we discover SATCOM Array NW07C. Inside, however, is really disappointing. We arrive on this first floor, there's nothing here. A big furnace in one corner, a shelf with nothing on it, a couple of lockers with minor scrap, a first aid box on one shelf, and some sort of blue glowing satellite dish thingy, which we can't interact with. Climbing up the stairs, we arrive on the second floor, there's nothing here. Continuing up the stairs, we arrive on the top floor, there's nothing here. Climbing a ladder, we arrive on a similar balcony, which brings us to a small room and a ladder leading to the satellite dish, but there's nothing here. What is the deal? Well, this satellite dish only becomes interesting after completing the quest, The Waters of Life. Then... If we visit the satellite array, outside we find the Enclave. Where? Go for kill shot. I'm This time when we head inside, we see scientists running all over the place. Dogmeat runs upstairs to take care of them. I read that this furnace was supposed to have a big pile of ghoul bodies, hence the blood on the ground. But for some reason, they didn't appear in my game. But the ghoul corpses, of course, make sense once we know more about the Enclave. Now we find footlockers on the ground, filled with energy weapons, and Enclave posters on the walls. This time when we reach the satellite dish, what's that? Racing to the edge of the dish, we see two vertebrates fly off into the distance. Yes, I know it was dark and hard to see, so here's what it looks like during the day. But I haven't completed the Waters of Life yet, and so I'll have to come back and explore it again at a later date. This array, unlike the last one, is comprised of two towers and two dishes, but the second dish has fallen off of the tower and we find it collapsed on the ground. A wastelander has turned it into a bit of a shack. What do you need? This scavenger works as a merchant and sells us random scrap. We find a small store of goods inside, but they're all marked as owned, so we can't take them without stealing. Heading outside the dish to the tower, we see that the front door is boarded up, so sadly, we can't head inside to explore it. This leaves only one array left to explore. From here, we have to travel east-northeast, Travel halfway across the wasteland to reach SATCOM Array NN-03D. Along the way, we'll fight many creatures. We'll stumble upon the Brotherhood Outcasts battling Death Claws. Oh, one of the outcasts died. Oh well, can't let the power armor go to waste. My T-51 needs to be repaired. Nearby there's a bit of a shack. Lots of blood and guts all over the place and a couple of ammo canisters, but they're empty. I must have already looted them in the past. 
We arrive at the base of SATCOM Array NNO3D, and it's covered in graffiti that can only mean one thing, raiders. Sure enough, just as we discover it, we get attacked by raiders. This array is comprised of three satellite towers, and they appear to be connected. We see ramps going between the dishes. We'll start by entering through the door of NNO3DA. We can then race upstairs to see if we've cleared it, and that looks like the final raider. With the raiders dead, we can head back to the ground to begin exploring. From the door, if we turn left, we find a table with a mine box beneath it and two frag mines lying on top of it. Here we also find a sawed-off shotgun. There's a bit of a kitchen to the northwest. We find some jet, a first aid box, and some buff out on a countertop, and then two refrigerators. There's some machinery here, but we can't interact with it. And in the southeastern corner, we find a butcher shop. Bodies hanging from the ceiling, and body parts being cut up on a table, complete with turpentine to what? Act as a disinfectant? This gives us the impression that these raiders are also cannibals. That completes the first floor, so heading up to the second, we don't find much. So heading upstairs to the top floor, we see that the raiders have covered this place in graffiti. We move west into the next room to loot an ammo box beneath a table and some mentats on the table, and then climb the ladder outside to the catwalk. From here, raiders at the neighboring towers begin to snipe at us. Coast clear, we can take the staircase from this catwalk to the top room. The top room is empty, so taking the staircase to the dish, we see that this is one of the lower dishes of the array. There is one tower in this array that towers above us. We find this dish connected to a neighboring one with a ramp. Whoop. Ooh. Oh, ho. almost fell to my death there. Okay, gotta be careful. Heading over to the ramp, we can cross to the neighboring dish, and here we find dozens of empty whiskey bottles scattered around the dish. And after seeing this, one of the entries we read in the Ghoul Scientist's terminal makes sense. She said that there was some sort of interference at one of the neighboring arrays. She assumed it must be rad roaches or something, but no, it was whiskey bottles. The raiders had just cast them into the dish. Heading down the hatch, we can loot some darts on a shelf. Not much else here. Heading outside to the catwalk, we can take it down, loot a raider corpse, and then enter the tower. We see shelves, but before we can loot, we get attacked. Aha! After killing the raiders, we can head back to the ladder to explore. Here we find a chess game set out on an oversized chessboard. The raiders were using miniature alcohol bottles and mini garden gnomes and energy cells as chess pieces. Everything about this is completely unique. The chessboard is larger than usual, the gnomes are smaller than usual, and the bottles are smaller than usual. We can take all of this back to our player home to use as settlement decorations if we're a collector and a completionist. There is a trick to this, though. If we find an oddly sized miscellaneous object in the game, the size of the object resets to its default size in our inventory if it stacks with another similar item in our inventory. So before looting all of this, we have to make sure that we don't have any chessboards, bottles, or garden gnomes in our inventory. Only then will the items keep their size. When done looting, we can cross the catwalk to the east. I passed by something that I missed right here. Let's rewind that. You see that balancing on the banister? I knocked it off accidentally. Here's what it looks like. The raiders have balanced a bunch of sporks on this railing. This is what happens when raiders have too much time on their hands. Heading downstairs to the second level, we see that this level is just covered in gore. So heading down to the final floor, we find a countertop with jet on it to the north, some mentats, and a bunch of teddy bears, which we can collect for little Marie. In a baby carriage nearby, we find some Psycho and Jet, and on the opposite end of the counter, we find bottles of Buff Out. 
Moving west, we find a chemistry station. Looks like this may be where they manufacture their own chems. We find Wonder Glue, of course. More jet inhalers, some more buff out all over the place. We can walk away with three vials here. And what's that? Looking west, we see a boarded up door, but on the other side of it, a huge oversized teddy bear. I think this was intended to be impossible to loot. But if on the PC, you can, of course, toggle clipping to walk on over. Or if on a console, there's a glitch you can use whereby you stand on a weapon and then pick up that weapon to push yourself to the other side of the door. Loot the bear and then use the same trick to push yourself back. Though remember, if you looted the other teddy bears here, this one will lose its unique size once it stacks with them. So you have to make sure that this is the only bear in your inventory. In the middle of this room, we find another chemistry table with some psycho and a blood pack. And moving south, we find some shelves with a bunch of boxes. With this floor explored, we can open a door to the east. Oh, and it keeps going. That's right, we found a third tower, a taller one. This must lead inside that third tower. Sure enough, at the end of the hallway, we find a door to NNO3DC. On the other side, we find a pile of beer bottles and toy cars at the bottom of a staircase. The beer bottles continue up the staircase, lining the nearby wall. Rounding the corner, we enter another raider den. Fun! Looks like that's it. Back on the bottom, we can loot some sugar bombs on a table to the east for Murphy's bombing run. There are two refrigerators to the west with booze and food next to a countertop covered in beer bottles. And what's this? Coffins? Oh, what are coffins doing here? Oh, they look old. These must be pre-war coffins. These raiders are not only murderers, cannibals, and druggies, but grave robbers as well. Where did they find these? There are three here and all of them still have skeletons inside. There's a beautiful Persian rug on the ground completely soiled with blood and empty whiskey bottles. My god, how much whiskey can these raiders drink? Jeez, they must have been here a long time. We see bunks against the southern wall, and at the end of each is a footlocker, one of which, of course, has whiskey in it. After looting the footlockers, we find some lockers in a bathroom we can loot. And in the bathroom, we find three toilets, one of which has a teddy bear on top. Exactly how many bears does a little Marie need? And the other has a copy of Pugilism Illustrated. With that, we fully explore this bottom floor. To leave, we can open up a door to the west, which leads to a hallway where we find a locked door. To unlock it, we can hack into a very easy locked wall terminal. Once hacked, we find an option to disengage lock. And now we can open the door to the capital wasteland. And immediately we learn where the raiders found the coffins. Just outside, we find two graves. Next to it was a third, but this coffin is empty. Both burial mounds are empty, giving us the impression that the raiders have already looted it. But what was a cemetery doing outside a military satcom array? I believe the key is in the fallout shelter sign we found on the first array that we explored. It may be that the pre-war government told the locals that they could hole up in these arrays in the event of a nuclear apocalypse. But of course, these arrays were not underground and likely weren't built to be fallout shelters. And so when the people sought refuge here, they still soaked up all of the fallout from the nuclear detonations. And then one by one, they died. The survivors then buried the dead outside until all were dead and buried and none were left. At any rate, with that, we fully explore the pre-war SATCOM arrays in the Capital Wasteland. And we unwittingly almost nuke ourselves by communicating with the High Water Trouser Satellite. Let me know your thoughts on this adventure in the comments section below. I publish many Fallout videos each and every week, so if you don't want to miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a brand new shirt in the shop. The Burned Man Walks. That's right, it's everyone's favorite burned and bandaged, blue-eyed, pistol-whipping ex-Legion Mormon. You can find this design on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. The design comes on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. I'm becoming more active on Twitter, 
I use Twitter to respond to viewers and to make channel announcements, like if I have to skip a day or when I'm going to be doing a live stream. So if you're active on Twitter, I encourage you to follow me at Oxhorn. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.